Russia's strategy to influence the 2016 US presidential election was designed for maximum deniability, but the evidence clearly shows Moscow's fingerprints everywhere. This is what we know about Russia's interference in the 2016 US election. For years, Moscow has dreamed of undermining the US-led liberal democratic order that it views as a threat to its oligarchy and the regime of Vladimir Putin. But its 2016 election activity demonstrated a significant escalation compared to previous operations. In September 2015, a few months before Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders squared off in the Iowa caucus, the FBI notified a cybersecurity contractor working for the Democratic National Committee that it had been infiltrated by a Russian cyber espionage group. It was the opening move in a hacking and information warfare campaign whose capabilities Russia had been developing for decades. Twenty years earlier, it launched the first major international cyber attack. Russian hackers infiltrated computer systems across the US government and stole so many files that if all the documents were printed and stacked, they would be taller than the Washington Monument. They also broke into networks in Canada, the UK, Brazil, and Germany. Despite this intrusion, the US was mainly concerned with fending off the Chinese, whose headline-grabbing attacks did more damage. Toward the end of George W. Bush's second term in 2007, Russia began using hacking for political purposes. First, it punished Estonia for joining the NATO military alliance. Then, Moscow shut down Georgia's internet before invading the small country. The first time in history, cyber weapons had been used in an actual war. President Obama's Secretary of Defense put Russia and China on notice that any moves against America's critical infrastructure would not be tolerated, and warned that the United States would consider a serious cyber attack an act of war. Attackers could also seek to disable or degrade critical military systems and communication networks. The collective result of these kinds of attacks could be a cyber Pearl Harbor. In 2014 and 15, as the US sanctioned Russia for its invasion of Ukraine, a Russian hacking group systematically infiltrated the State Department, the White House, and the Joint Chiefs of Staff. State had to repeatedly shut down its systems to expel the intruders, while in Vienna, Secretary Kerry's team had to use Gmail to communicate. President Obama received briefings on all of these attacks, but the White House thought retaliating too strongly could start an all-out cyber war, or even a real war. But the Russians became more emboldened. They intercepted and broadcast a phone call of an Obama administration official expressing frustration with Europe. Then they stole documents from George Soros' Open Society Foundation and released doctored versions to make it seem Soros was funding Putin's opposition. Still, they were met with little resistance for crossing the line, so they crossed it even more. On the day a French TV network debuted a new channel, its entire system was shut down by malicious software that began to rapidly destroy its computers. A quick-thinking tech identified the infected machine and disconnected it. The Russians behind the attack tried to make it look like the work of terrorists calling themselves the Cyber Caliphate. Next, the Kremlin ordered the first known successful cyber attack on another nation's power grid, disrupting the electricity supply of 230,000 Ukrainians. Which brings us to the operation to interfere in the election, the first time a foreign government has acted so boldly against American democracy. Seven months after he was first notified by the FBI of the Russian intrusion in the DNC's computer system, the cybersecurity contractor finally confirmed that an unauthorized user was inside the network. It's unclear exactly why it took him so long to take a closer look. Part of the problem was a lack of follow-through by the FBI agent who had warned him the year before, but the Democratic National Committee, a nonprofit, also hadn't spent enough money on cybersecurity. The party would pay dearly for that mistake. It then brought on leading cybersecurity firm CrowdStrike, and within a day, it was confirmed that the breach had originated in Russia and was the work of two different hacking groups. Cozy Bear, believed to be either Russia's Federal Security Service or its Foreign Intelligence Service, and Fancy Bear, thought to be Russia's military intelligence agency, GRU. But identifying the hackers didn't help the DNC. The intruders had gone undetected in their system for so long that the damage was already done. The only question was how much damage. When the Russians assessed the time was right to begin publishing the documents, they set up aliases and fake websites to create confusion and undermine evidence that connected them to the hack. On July 6, 2016, 12 days before the Republican National Convention, Guccifer released a gold mine for Republican operatives, the DNC's counter-strategy. Then, on the eve of the Democratic National Convention, WikiLeaks published 44,000 DNC emails. The messages were fairly mundane, 
but some revealed that a few party officials favored Clinton over her opponent Bernie Sanders. To political observers, this was unsurprising. Hillary Clinton had been a superstar in the party for 25 years, while Bernie Sanders, an independent, wasn't even technically a Democrat. But that didn't matter to Sanders' supporters, who were still bitter over his loss. The leaks gave them someone to blame. Debbie Wasserman Schultz, the party chairwoman who had planned the entire convention and was about to preside over it, was forced to abruptly resign. Still unsatisfied, angry Sanders delegates protested throughout the event, including during Clinton's acceptance speech. As the election entered its final weeks, Democratic candidates in dozens of states were targeted by leaked documents stolen from the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee. Conspicuously missing from all these leaks was any publication of Republican emails. Instead of condemning the hacks as the act of a foreign government against America's sacred democratic process, Republican presidential nominee Donald Trump praised Putin. Falling further behind in the polls, he directly asked Russia to find Hillary Clinton's emails. Russia, if you're listening, I hope you're able to find the 30,000 emails that are missing. I think you will probably be rewarded mightily by our press. But Russia didn't need any prodding. They liked the prospect of Trump becoming president so much, they had even explored the possibility of directly tampering with the vote. In June, the FBI sent a warning to states that bad actors were probing state voter registration databases and systems in search of vulnerabilities. In July, CIA Director John Brennan was so alarmed over intelligence reports that Russia was trying to hack the election that he formed a working group of officials from the CIA, FBI, and NSA. In August, Brennan called his Russian counterpart, the head of the Federal Security Service, to warn him against meddling in the presidential election. Two weeks later, the FBI issued a nationwide flash alert, warning state election officials about foreign infiltration. The alert included technical evidence detailing Russian responsibility and urged states to boost their cyber defenses. The Department of Homeland Security determined that while over three dozen states had their election departments infiltrated, none of the compromised systems were involved in actual vote tallying. It is unclear whether the Russian hackers were blocked from disrupting the vote, or whether the Kremlin simply decided not to. The hacking methods the Russians used to gain access to these systems was fairly basic. Phishing and spear phishing, which uses a tailored email to trick a specific person into thinking the message is from a trusted source. Throw enough spears into a school of fish and you're bound to have some hits. There was no bigger fish to skewer than Hillary Clinton's campaign chairman, John Podesta. One month before the election, WikiLeaks began publishing a daily stream of Podesta's entire email archive. The timing of the release is highly suspicious. The first batch hit the internet just half an hour after the Washington Post made public the infamous Access Hollywood tape of Trump. Just like the DNC emails, the Podesta archive did not contain any major bombshells, but it did open the door for the second phase of Russia's operation, a barrage of fake news stories written on blogs and posted to social media where they were spread by a small army of Russian-run Twitter and Facebook accounts. Because no one was going to read the many thousands of leaked Democratic emails, they were cited as the source for hundreds of fake news stories. Many of them were too crazy to believe, but the sheer number of them that passed through the social media feeds of tens of millions of Americans helped to plant seeds of doubt about Clinton's integrity and trustworthiness. Testifying before the Senate Intelligence Committee after the election, Former FBI agent Clint Watts described how this strategy targeted swing voters. I know this from working on influence campaigns in the counterterrorism context. If you do an appropriate target audience analysis on social media, you can actually identify an audience in a foreign country or in the United States, parse out all of their preferences. Part of the reason those bios had conservative, Christian, you know, America, all those terms in it is those are the most common ones. If you inhale all the accounts of people in Wisconsin, you identify the most common terms in it. You just recreate accounts that look exactly like people from Wisconsin. So that way, whenever you're trying to socially engineer them and convince them that the information is true, it's much more simple because you see somebody and they look exactly like you, even down to the pictures. When you look at the pictures, it looks like an American from the Midwest or the South or Wisconsin or whatever the location is. Which brings us to the third phase of the operation, mobilizing Russia's state-run propaganda machine. Outlets like RT and Sputnik contributed to the influence campaign by serving as a platform for Kremlin messaging to Russian and international audiences. It had consistently cast President Trump as the target of unfair coverage 
from traditional US media outlets who it says served a corrupt political establishment. RT's coverage of Secretary Clinton throughout the US presidential campaign was consistently negative and focused on her leaked emails and accused her of corruption, poor physical and mental health, and ties to Islamic extremism. Thousands of paid Russian trolls spread these stories on social media and the comments sections of news organizations. The likely financier of the so-called Internet Research Agency of Professional Trolls located in St. Petersburg is a close Putin ally with ties to Russian intelligence. A journalist who is a leading expert on the Internet Research Agency tied social media accounts to Russia's professional trolls by showing how they were previously devoted to supporting Russian actions in Ukraine before advocating for President Trump as early as December 2015. In 2013, RT's editor-in-chief had visited WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange in person at the Ecuadorian embassy in London to discuss renewing his contract with RT. And during the 2016 campaign, Assange became one of Russia's most valuable propagandists. On August 6th, RT published an English language video called Julian Assange Special, Do WikiLeaks Have the Email That'll Put Clinton in Prison? and an exclusive interview with Assange entitled Clinton and ISIS Funded by the Same Money. RT's most popular video on Secretary Clinton, how 100% of the Clinton's charity went to themselves, had more than 9 million views on social media platforms. RT's most popular English language video about Trump called Trump Will Not Be Permitted to Win featured Assange and had 2.2 million views. The month before the release of the Podesta emails, President Obama had pulled Putin aside during a summit in China to tell him to stop meddling in the election. What I was concerned about in particular was making sure that that wasn't compounded by potential hacking that could hamper vote counting, affect the actual election process itself. And so in early September when I saw President Putin in China, I felt that the most effective way to ensure that that didn't happen was to talk to him directly and tell him to cut it out and there were going to be some serious consequences if he didn't. After the release of the Podesta emails, the Obama administration issued a direct threat to Russia through the Moscow-Washington crisis hotline that further action would be met with armed conflict. President Obama was now squarely focused on deterring Putin from taking more aggressive actions that could actually disrupt voting on election day. But few US media outlets understood the gravity of the situation at the time. Many American journalists were seduced by the gossipy nature of the leaks and the clicks they generated. Every major publication wrote several stories citing the DNC and Podesta emails, becoming an inadvertent instrument of Russia. Then, Mother Jones reported on the existence of a 35-page dossier written by a former MI6 agent. It sourced numerous Russian insiders and laid out the details of Russia's operation to help Trump become president. While few news outlets picked up on it then, since the election, BuzzFeed has published it in full. Many of its claims have been verified both by the media and US intelligence agencies, and Presidents Obama and Trump both received briefings on it. According to the dossier, in the run-up to the election, Putin fully understood the operation may have gone too far, and that Russia was exposed and beginning to suffer significant blowback. His team had been caught off guard by how effectively investigative journalists and the American government was exposing parts of the operation, but there was no denying it was working, even if things were getting a little too messy. Before Obama told him in person to cut it out, Putin had already moved command of the operation from the foreign ministry to the FSB and then into his own presidential administration. He had ordered his team not to discuss it in public or private, and he had dismissed the man who had been coordinating the effort, his chief of staff, Sergei Ivanov. On election night, Putin, like everyone else, was left to wait and see if he had done enough to make Trump president. The election turned out to be extremely close. Donald Trump's margin of victory was less than 1% in Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin, which combined for 46 electoral votes, more than enough to sway the outcome. Russian media hailed Trump's victory as a vindication of Putin's advocacy of global populist movements and the latest example of Western liberalism's collapse. Reports said officials in the Kremlin popped champagne the night of the election. Intelligence agencies assess with a high degree of confidence that Moscow will apply lessons learned from this campaign 
to future influence efforts in the United States and the rest of the world, including against American allies and their election processes. The New York Times summarized the operation this way, While there's no way to be certain of the ultimate impact of the hack, this much is clear. A low-cost, high-impact weapon that Russia had test-fired in elections from Ukraine to Europe was trained on the United States with devastating effectiveness. For Russia, with an enfeebled economy and a nuclear arsenal it cannot use short of an all-out war, cyber power proved the perfect weapon, cheap, hard to see coming, hard to trace. Putin, a student of martial arts, had turned two institutions at the core of American democracy, political campaigns and independent media, to his own ends. So that's the question, what are those ends? In part two of our investigation, we'll present Putin's motives for helping Donald Trump become president instead of Hillary Clinton. Thanks for watching. For The Daily Conversation, I'm Bryce Plank.